This DeLorean has been customized with a 3-liter engine, an electronic fuel injection system, and a throttle position sensor. Now, luckily, it doesn't need the throttle position sensor because it doesn't work. Well, that's not entirely true. The sensor works fine. It's just that every sensor I bolt up to this throttle body seizes open for some reason, so they're all useless. I talked about this more in my last video about the car stalling at stop signs. The thing is, I would like a working throttle position sensor, so I'm going to make my own 3D printed mount and attach it to the valve cover. And while I'm at it, I'm gonna see how well different filaments survive being bolted directly to a hot engine. Let me explain why I want a throttle position sensor in this car. A stock DeLorean uses an older form of fuel injection that doesn't actually have a TPS at all. And my three liter engine has been running just fine with the TPS disabled. So it's not strictly required that you have one to have a working fuel injection system. But the TPS gives the ECU a hint about what you're trying to do when you push the pedal. This allows it to react more intelligently and more rapidly to your input. How much that actually matters in a 160 horsepower touring car like this is up for debate, but it's still nice to have. There are a few different kinds of throttle position sensor technologies to choose from, but the throttle body on my engine accepts an older style analog sensor that is really just a spring-loaded linear potentiometer in a waterproof case. This design talks to the ECU with three wires. The first two represent fully closed with zero volts and fully open with five volts. The voltage on the third wire will be somewhere between those two and it changes with the actual position of the throttle. And that wire is what the ECU listens to. The sensor I'm using is normally mounted to the side of this Jeep throttle body. I have one installed now, not because it's working. I mean, <laughs> that would be ridiculous, but because I need something to plug the hole that would otherwise be a rather large vacuum leak. The problem I'm having is that the sensor is supposed to spring back to close when I let go of the throttle, but every sensor I mount there sticks open. I can't find anything wrong with the sensor or the throttle body. It just stays open until I unbolt it, and then it suddenly snaps closed. Since this was confusing the Megascore ECU, I made it think the throttle was always closed by just unplugging the sensor and jumping the sense wire to ground. This works because Megasquirt doesn't actually require a TPS. It can look at things like engine vacuum to guess what the engine is doing and just adjust the fuel delivery entirely based on that although it does this with less accuracy and speed than it could with a TPS. This is why you don't strictly need a TPS, as long as you remember to disable all the other features that rely on it. But I was never really happy about bypassing the TPS like this. It enables a bunch of features, and I'd like to use at least some of them in my car, so I'm just gonna ignore this whole Jeep throttle body setup and mount the TPS somewhere else. My plan is to 3D print a TPS carrier that attaches to the valve cover and use a cable to actually turn the TPS. And look, two conveniently empty holes that I can bolt it to. I'm using Moto's procedural tools to design this. The first part holds the TPS itself and has this angle bit that gets bolted to those holes in the valve cover. This arm will turn the TPS when it's pulled by the cable and this last piece just holds everything together. So the question now is what kind of plastic do I print this in? Engines get hot, so I need something that won't melt or deform. The oil filler cap on the other valve cover is made of plastic, so I know this is possible. I just don't know which plastic will work best. So I'm just gonna make three prints, one in PLA, one in PETG, and one in ASA, and I'll just see which one survives. I'm gonna try PLA first, mostly because it's already loaded into the printer and I'm lazy. I put some washers on the arm to act as bearings and also to keep everything more or less lined up and the cap has some heat set inserts for the screws. The limiting factor here is going to be the glass transition temperature of PLA. It's only about 145 degrees. Above that, it becomes rubbery, but it won't melt until around 310 degrees. The problem is the valve cover gets close to 180 degrees. So this isn't really gonna be about how well PLA works so much as how badly it fails. Here it is after about 20 minutes of driving. It's not supposed to flex like that. It feels springy and rubbery. Both mounting bolts are loose now, as is one of the assembly screws. It stiffened up pretty quick once I got it off the valve cover, but that doesn't really matter. The curve was not there when I printed it. It's permanent now. Well, that went about as well as I could have expected. I mean, PLA was never going to work here, but it's interesting to see what happens when you try to push things beyond their limits. Here's my first PETG print. There are a lot of errors in these parts. The layers are separating and the pieces broke very easily. I'm guessing that the filament absorbed some moisture since the last time I used it. I dried it out in an oven for a few hours and got much better results with the next print. 
PETG has a glass transition temperature of around 180 degrees, which is almost how hot the valve cover gets. So I'm not entirely sure that this is going to fare much better than the PLA. I'm back for another drive and the PETG held up remarkably well. It is still very rigid with no real flex going on. All the bolts and screws are still where they should be, not loose at all. My only concern is that it's below freezing out right now, so even though it made it through this test, a hot summer day might push it too far. And finally, I made an ASA version, which is like an upgraded version of ABS with better properties for outdoor use. It transitions at around 210 degrees, so it'll probably work fine bolted to the engine. I'm guessing that the oil filler cap is made of either ASA or ABS. And here it is, still solid after 20 minutes of driving with no signs of flexing at all. Everything's still bolted in and nothing is loose. ASA it is. Now I have to figure out how to attach this to the throttle. I'm just gonna use a cable, but there's only one mounting point left and it moves in the wrong direction. So I'm gonna print a new clip that supports two cables so I can just mount it where the transmission cable already is. I'm basing this design on the clip that's already there. The slit down the center lets it flex enough to snap onto the throttle without breaking. My prototype didn't have that and it did indeed break in half when I tried to attach it. Next, I have to figure out how to actually build a cable. I bought a generic kit with five meters of cable, some sheath, a bunch of other stuff, and no instructions. Luckily, the cable I need is pretty simple, so it didn't take too long to figure it out. I only need about four inches of sheath, which I cut with cable cutters. Do not use side cutters or you'll ruin them, like this set of side cutters that I ruined. I crimped on ferrules with a pair of pliers. I was worried about collapsing the sheath, but it's sturdier than I thought, and it wasn't at all affected by this. And that's it for the sheath. There's just not much to it. I cut off a length of cable and I put a proper barrel on one end with solder and everything. It's not the prettiest solder job, but it gets the job done and it's plenty strong. I mean, not bad for my first attempt. For the other end, I'm using one of these screw style cable stops. They're easy to adjust and I've had them on the other cables for tens of thousands of miles without an issue, so they should be fine. The sheath needs to be anchored somehow to stop it from flexing around and to keep the cable from rubbing against the bracket. I'm going to try printing a clamp that just binds my cable to the transmission cable. I went through a few versions of this to get it to the right tightness without the cable slipping out from under it. And the cable binds. If I turn the clamp one way it works, but if it twists around the other way it'll bind. Crap. Okay, so I designed this thing to hold the sheath instead. It hooks onto the top of the bracket and clamps around the end of the transmission cable and the TPS cable and it doesn't bind. The last thing to do is plug it in and calibrate it in Tuner Studio. The calibration is pretty simple. Just click a button when the throttle's all the way open and click another button when it's all the way closed. And Tuner Studio takes care of the rest. Hmm, the TPS isn't always going all the way to zero. I think the built-in spring isn't strong enough to also pull back the cable. No big deal, I'll just add my own spring after I print a new arm and a new end cap with holes for the spring to mount, but that shouldn't take too long. And there we go. That's working much better. And now I can turn on other settings like idling when the throttle's below 1% or enabling flood clear support. And I'll have more useful logs as well. I should get better deceleration and acceleration now and better full throttle response. Will I notice? Maybe. But then I think the car runs better after I fill the washer fluid, so who knows. And there you have it, a working throttle position sensor. And check out this video if you want to see how I figured out that the throttle position sensor was causing my car to stall in the first place. Thanks for watching.